My name is Susan Roberts and I welcome you to my presentation Is Shakespeare Sir Francis Bacon? To have written the greatest works in English literature, the author displayed knowledge that has never been surpassed. And the identity of this universal genius, the man who ticks all the boxes, Sir Francis Bacon. Sir Francis Bacon, Authorship Theory History of the Baconian Shakespeare The first to openly infer in writing that Francis Bacon was the author Shakespeare were the Inns of Court lawyer poets Joseph Hall and John Marston, who, in an exchange of satires published between 1597 and 1598 refer to the author of the Shakespeare poem Venus and Adonis as Labio, a jurist, who is also to be identified by the motto Mediocria Firma. The motto was the specific heraldic motto of Francis and Anthony Bacon at that time, but of the two, only Francis Bacon was a jurist. Many years previous to this, Bacon himself had written in a letter that he was a concealed poet, whilst his literary friend Toby Matthew had pointed out, also in a letter, that Bacon was known to the world under another name. Later, Ben Jonson, in his Discoveries, published in 1641, eulogised Bacon in the identical and unique way he had praised the author Shakespeare in the Shakespeare folio as he that hath filled up all numbers, etc. In 1679, Thomas Tennyson, afterwards Bishop of Canterbury, who published some of Bacon's unpublished writings in a collection called Baconiana or Certain Genuine Remains of Sir Francis Bacon, referred to Bacon as having written under names other than his own. Almost a century later, in 1769, a book entitled The Life and Adventures of Common Sense, an historical allegory, was published anonymously. It claimed that a character called Wisdom, clearly identifiable as Francis Bacon, had made acquaintance with a person belonging to the playhouse and had commenced playwriting under the name Shakespeare. The earliest completely explicit suggestion that Francis Bacon was the author Shakespeare was made in 1781 by the Reverend James Wilmot, rector of Barton-on-the-Heath, a little village a few miles north of Stratford-upon-Avon. Being an avid researcher of Shakespeare, Reverend Wilmot failed to discover any significant evidence that the actor Shakespeare was the author of the Shakespeare works. However, what James Wilmot noticed was that astounding similarities of diction, phrase, thought, opinion and even error between the works of Bacon and those of Shakespeare and he came to the conclusion that the real author must have been Francis Bacon. Reverend Wilmot's unpublished research was communicated to the Ipswich Philosophical Society by James Corton Cowell on 7th of February, 1805. Gorhambury House, home of Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon's parents, or should it be foster parents? As we are all aware, lifestyle and upbringing of a child plays an important role towards their success in later years. Therefore, the Elizabethan household honed Francis Bacon requires investigation. Firstly, background information on Sir Nicholas Bacon and his wife Lady Anne, and afterwards 
we will explore the possibility that they were but foster parents to Francis. Sir Nicholas studied at Cambridge University's Corpus Christi College. From there he went on to Gray's Inn, one of the inns of court, where talented and aspiring young gentlemen from Oxford and Cambridge learned law. It was also a sort of preparatory school for service in the royal court and in the administration of the government. He would go on to become Queen Elizabeth's Lord Chancellor, the highest legal position of the land, an office that Francis would some day hold himself. Lady Anne Bacon was the daughter of Sir Anthony Cook, who was tutor to Queen Elizabeth's half-brother before he became Edward VI. Anne was a woman of keen intellect and strong Puritan views. She was well trained in Latin and Greek, and as the daughter of a tutor to the royal family, she received the education he would have given a princess. Lady Anne, Sir Nicholas's second wife, had a child, Anthony, born in 1558. He was three years older than Francis. From an early age, Anthony and Francis received schooling of the highest academic standard. Day-to-day -day life in the Bacon household started with family prayers and ended with stories of classical adventures, morality tales and the ancient myths. Lord Keeper to Queen Elizabeth, Sir Nicholas was a sound lawyer and a witty man, revelling in classical literature. He was also a writer. However, a book he published had the result of excluding him from the Privy Council. Henceforth, he wrote anonymously. He not only saw the joy of writing a book, but he learned the value of being anonymous and the use of a pen name. In later years, Francis would have cause to follow his example. Please keep this in mind. In a letter written by Lady Bacon to her son Anthony regarding Francis, she makes this remarkable statement. Explain to him, it is not my meaning to treat him as a ward. Such a word is far from my motherly feeling for him. I mean to do him good. Such a significant phrase reveals the real relationship of the Bacons. Francis was not their son. It is therefore quite consistent that Francis Bacon should write to Sir Toby Matthew and refer to Anthony as his friend, not as his brother. True, Francis signs the dedication of his essays to Anthony, your entire loving brother. But this is because in later life they were brother Masons and members of the Rosy Cross, the Rosicrucian Society. If Lady Anne and Sir Nicholas Bacon are foster parents, then who are Francis's biological parents? The Royal Secret, 1561 January. At this time, the chief lady in waiting to Queen Elizabeth was Lady Anne Bacon, wife to Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal. If a child were about to be born to the Queen, and such a birth had to be kept secret, would it not be natural for her to turn to Lady Bacon, her closest, intimate and greatest friend? To save the Queen's honour, and with the active connivance of Sir Nicholas, it would be most prudent for Lady Bacon to assume the role of mother to the royal child. Sometime in January, about four months after an alleged secret morganatic marriage, explanation later, of Elizabeth to Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, his wife Amy Dudley, near Robsard, having conveniently fallen downstairs to her death, Lady Bacon is supposed to have given birth to a child, and that child being known to history as Francis Bacon. However, facts seem to indicate 
that Francis was not of their flesh and blood, that the Bacons simply served in the capacity of foster parents. We can begin with this statement made by Dr Rawley, published in 1657, 31 years after Francis's death. Dr Rawley was Francis Bacon's chaplain, confidant, personal friend and attendant. Francis Bacon, the glory of his age and nation, the adorner and ornament of learning, was born in York House, or York Place in the Strand. Rawley's opening statement that Francis Bacon was born in York House, or York Place, he uses italics to draw attention to the phrase, is intended to provoke the reader to ascertain where Francis was born, and who were his parents. For York House was the residence of Sir Nicholas Bacon, but York Place was the Queen's Palace, afterwards known as Whitehall. The statement begs the question, was Francis a Bacon born at York House, or a Tudor born at York Place? The known facts. In January 1561, the Queen was in residence in York Place, and had no public engagements or interviews. The 22nd of January is Francis Bacon's birthday. Registering the birth. An equally intriguing fact is that in the church at St Martin's in the Fields, London, the baby is registered as Mr Franciscus Bacon. The actual entry in Latin is on the first page of the book. However, someone in a different handwriting and in paler ink has added, son of Nicholas Bacon. Now why was the baby registered as Mr? It was contrary to all customs of registration. Would his actual parents, if they were really Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne, be likely to dignify a baby with the title of Mr.? Sir Nicholas never recorded the birth of his four other four sons in that way. It is impossible to think that such a prefix would ever have been occurred to them had he been their own child. It is, on the contrary, easily understandable that if Francis Bacon were a young prince, his foster parents would seek to dignify the baby by giving him an extraordinary title as a covert mark of respect. Is it not significant that the entry in the church records is written firstly without the name of the father, then later a different hand in paler ink has added son of Nicholas Bacon? A further piece of intrigue. Francis was never entered in the family genealogy of Nicholas Bacon. Yet another piece of the puzzle as to the parentage, Sir Nicholas Bacon's will. We're jumping forward here. Sir Nicholas Bacon's will. In February 1579, Sir Nicholas Bacon died. He was a very wealthy man, being much in favour with the Queen, who had loaded him with money and presents. In December, only a few weeks prior to his death, he had made an elaborate will. After his death, the reading of his will disclosed he had left large sums of money to his children by a first wife and a sufficient income for Lady Anne and her son Anthony. But the name of Francis was not even mentioned. Strangely, neither Lady Bacon nor indeed any member of the family expressed astonishment that Sir Nicholas's will made no monetary provision for Francis. Francis himself shows no surprise at the will's content and deeply misses Sir Nicholas. Can it be that Francis expects his inheritance to lie elsewhere? I will now explain the meaning of morganatic marriage denoting a marriage in which neither the spouse of lower rank nor any children have any claim to the possessions or title of the spouse of higher rank. 
Here's an anecdote. When Queen Victoria was staying at Wilton House, the Earl of Pembroke informed her that in the monument room was a document. It contained evidence that Queen Elizabeth was pregnant with Dudley's child and that the two were secretly married at Wilton in 1560. Victoria demanded to see the document and after reading it, threw it in the fire saying, one must not interfere with history. More evidence that Francis is not a member of the Bacon family. Sir Francis Bacon as a child. In this portrait, the child Francis is pictured holding an apple in his right hand whilst his left hand covers his heart. No detail of good Renaissance painting was without an intended symbolic meaning. The apple is an age-old symbol of the fruit of knowledge. Note the child's rich dark brown or hazel eyes. Queen Elizabeth and her mother Anne Boleyn had similar eye colouring, as did Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Whereas Nicholas Bacon's family inherited predominantly grey-blue eyes, this being an important factor for later discussion. Around Francis's shoulders hangs a framed miniature painting suspended on a double chain. Why the double chain? Looking carefully, it would appear that there are two miniatures. The larger one almost conceals the smaller frame beneath. The most reasonable explanation for the miniatures is that they are intended to portray Francis's parents. Upon scrutiny, one sees that the top visible portrait is that of a bearded nobleman, possibly the father, whilst the portrait of a woman, possibly the mother, being someone hid, hidden from view underneath. But why hide a portrait of the child's mother? Surely this would be an insult to the mother. On examination of the top miniature, it appears that the figure has a high forehead with bearded narrow face and wears clothing much like that of a courtier soldiers. There is no resemblance to Sir Nicholas Bacon. Is it a depiction of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester? If this is correct, then it makes absolute sense as to why the portrait of the woman is practically concealed. Elizabeth would have been instantly recognised and it was crucial to her keeping the throne that she maintained her virgin queen public image. Francis Bacon's eye colour. Francis was the only dark-eyed child in the Bacon family of blue-eyed and grey-eyed people. There is an entire family tree where one can see a reproduction that they are all obviously fair and it is very rare for light-eyed people to produce dark -eyed, a dark-eyed child. Professor Briscoe Ford, Professor of Genetics at Oxford, says that if Sir Francis Bacon had dark brown eyes and both parents had grey, the chance that he is fostered is very high. In the portraits of Elizabeth, her eyes are shown to be brown, black brown or black. Robert Dudley's eyes are brown, though not as dark as Elizabeth's. His hair in all his portraits is very curly. Francis had curly hair, unlike the other Bacon sons. Between Elizabeth and Leicester, the characteristics to producing a child with dark eyes and curly hair are all there. Another feature of interest is Bacon's nose. There is a nose which exactly replicates Francis's, which is long but has a slight bulging of flesh at the tip. It can be seen in Holbein's portrait of Henry VIII. Francis, the Queen and Leicester Francis growing up. Year after year, from 1565 to 1578, we find the Queen visiting the Bacon family at Gorhambury House, 
and Robert Dudley, knighted Earl of Leicester in 1564, almost always accompanied her. As such a regular visitor to the home of Sir Nicholas, it could be thought that Nick Elizabeth was then able to supervise Francis's welfare and education. The boy's future was problematic. He had to remain a concealed child as to his real status. Francis, at about five years of age, was first taken to the royal court and, of course, would have been introduced as Sir Nicholas Bacon's youngest child. At the age of 13, following another visit of the Queen to Gorhambury House, Francis was sent to Cambridge University. Strangely, he did not go to St Bennet's College, where Sir Nicholas had been educated, but to Trinity College, founded by Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, and visited by Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, in 1564, the year he was knighted. Here Francis was placed in charge of Whitgift, the head of the college, who was made one of the Queen's private chaplains. After two years, 15-year-old Francis left the university to enter Gray's Inn, a law school. The Queen sends Francis to France. Francis must have been in contact with the Queen, for we next learn that when he was just 18 years old, suddenly he is torn from his legal studies by the Queen and sent to France with the English ambassador. We know he was sent away personally and directly by Elizabeth because he writes, I went with Sir Amias Paulette into France from Her Majesty's royal hand. Since then, I have made Her Majesty's service the scope of my life. No other young nobleman was sent to France directly from Her Majesty's royal hand. No other youth was sent in the entourage of the Queen's ambassador and given entry to the French court. Why the sudden removal to France? One possibility is that at 18 years old and having learned of his birthright, Francis was not being discreet. This, however, is conjecture. Francis Bacon in love. The French court was licentious, yet brilliantly intellectual. King Henry of Navarre, purely for reasons of state, had married Marguerite de Valois. Though her beauty had inspired all the French poets and literatures, her husband had been so indifferent to her that the marriage had not been consummated. When 18-year-old Francis Bacon arrived at the French court, a divorce was being arranged at Margaret's instigation. Aged 25, the beautiful French queen was in the prime of womanhood. She was the recognised leader of the court, especially on the social and intellectual side. Her outgoing personality, the snowy whiteness of her complexion, along with raven black hair and her many accomplishments, made her the centre of attraction. Queen Margaret's salon was thronged with thinkers and scholars, philosophers, scientists, poets, literatures, inventors and the like attracted by the genius of her intellectual personality. Thus it was that when Francis Bacon was introduced to the French court, he discovered a vibrant spirit vastly different from that of, of his homeland. Francis promptly fell in love, and the woman who stirred him was no less a person than Queen Marguerite. His passion for Marguerite had the direct result of bringing into being the most remarkable diary of emotion ever written. He wrote a series of sonnets to her, outpouring his emotions in verse. And throughout the earth, to old age, when in great strife, he found hearties by pursuing the habit he had acquired in France. The Marguerite sonnets were the beginnings of the mysterious body of verse known today as Sheikh Hyphen Spears' sonnets. From his contact 
with Marguerite, he acquired the practice of clothing emotions in imaginative terms. During his stay in France, we know that Francis visited Spain, Italy, Germany, Vienna, Padua, Verona and Florence, all the while gathering important information for his later writings. The English ambassador, Sir Amyas Paulette, must have been aware of Francis Bacon's infatuation with Queen Marguerite and would be duty-bound to inform Queen Elizabeth. In February 1579, as we already know, Sir Nicholas Bacon died. He is said to have caught a chill and Francis returned to England. Life in England From 1579, after his return from France, Francis Bacon lived at Gray's Inn, involved in legal studies, philosophical pursuits, poetry, speech writing, playwriting and the design of masks and entertainments. Meanwhile, Francis's stepbrother, Anthony Bacon, travelled around the continent as an intelligencer, a spy, for the Queen. Anthony, who left England in September 1579 for a tour of the continent, sent Francis a constant stream of intelligence as well as a supply of books and manuscripts from the various countries he visited. In 1592, after 12 years abroad, Anthony returned to England. He and Francis established a private scrivenry, a writing workshop, funded mainly by Anthony's inheritance from his father. It was about the time Anthony returned home that Francis Bacon started his promise of formularies and elegancies, a storehouse or notebooks which are now housed in the British Museum, containing nearly 2,000 observations and expressions in several languages, many of which were incorporated into the Shakespeare plays. More on the promise later. In April 1594, Anthony took up residence in Bishopgate. Francis continued to live at Gray's Inn, but in addition had a country residence at Twickenham Lodge across the river from Richmond Palace, where some of his literary activity took place. Any open acknowledgement of writing poetry and plays would have been likely to hinder Francis Bacon's pursuit of high office. The Earl of Surrey wrote, Poets were ever thought unfit for state. The publication of any literature could involve its author in criminal punishment if it were thought to be libelous, licentious or politically offensive. Hence many authors wrote anonymously to assume a little more liberty and freedom of speech. Shortly we'll discuss the pseudonym adopted by Francis for this purpose. Anthony Bacon died in 1601. His surviving correspondence, carefully collected by Francis Bacon, resides in Lambeth Palace Library. On the 24th of March, 1603, the Queen dies. She does not name an heir. King James VI of Scotland becomes James I of England. From 1607 onwards, Francis was appointed to increasingly higher positions of state by King James. 1609, Sir Francis Bacon writes a eulogy to Elizabeth I entitled Felicum Memoriam Elizabetha. William Shakespeare Stratford writes not a word. The production of the so-called Shakespeare plays became correspondingly less until in 1613, when Francis became Attorney General and they ceased altogether. That is, until the first folio published in a period 1621 to 1626, when Francis Bacon had fallen from grace, was unemployed and so had free time. Remember, dates are important. 
What's in a name? In Elizabethan times, playwrights were frowned upon. It was not a profession for, for an aristocrat or gentleman. To reveal his true identity would have resulted in harsh consequences. So Francis Bacon chose a pseudonym. In actual fact, he had more than one pseudonym, but we will concentrate on the main one, Pallas Athena. Pallas Athena is the Greek goddess of wisdom. She is the patroness of the useful and elegant arts, imparting the Masonic virtues of prudence, courage and perseverance. Britannia on English coins is modelled on this goddess. In Greek art, she is depicted with a helmet on her head. She held the spear of knowledge in her right hand, poised to strike at the serpent of ignorance writhing under her foot. The helmet denoted that she waged invisibly a silent war against sloth and ignorance. She was usually placed on the Greek temples with a golden spear in her hand. When the morning rays of the sun glinted on the weapon, causing it apparently to tremble, the people were in the habit of saying, Athena is shaking her spear. She was thus known as the shaker of the spear. Members of the Palace Athena Secret Literary Society in London had a ritual created by Francis Bacon and were initiated with an elaborate ceremonial. The initiate was capped with the helmet of Pallas to denote he was henceforth and invisible in the fight for human advancement. A large spear was placed in his hand indicative of a pen for he was to shake the spear of knowledge at the dragons of ignorance. Francis Bacon was head of this literary band of spear shakers. The 16th century was an age when literary disguises often employed a hyphen in a name resonant with meaning. The hyphen shake space spear on Thorpe's 1609 edition of shake hyphen spear sonnets was indicative of a pseudonym. The sonnets were not published under the name William Shakespeare, but simply as Shake Hyphen Spears Sonnets. We've dealt with why Shakespeare was chosen as the name, so what about William? William, which is a very common name in England even to the present day, alludes to Apollo's golden helmet of light, for which both Apollo and his feminine counterpart Pallas Athena were particularly noted, along with their shaking spears. Francis Bacon was often referred to as Apollo by his peers. Coincidentally, when Francis was born, Queen Elizabeth was given two names by the court astrologer John Dee, who was privy to the secret of the baby, and who had been introduced to Elizabeth by Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Using astrological charts, the names selected by Dee were for either Francis or William. Francis Bacon had a vocabulary of some 20,000 words. He painted broad canvases of life that taught the triumph of goodness and the dethronement of evil, great epics of moral power. If Bacon, being an aristocrat, had openly declared the views that he put into the mouths of various characters in the plays, he would have been brought into conflict with church and state. In 1623, the Shakespeare plays had been gathered together in an omnibus volume, containing 20 plays printed for the first time and 16 previously printed. These 16 previously printed plays were largely rewritten but by whom? Shakespeare of Stratford, be it remembered, had died seven years earlier in 1616, whereas Sir Francis Bacon died in 1626, which is three years after the folio was released. Alice Barnum Bacon Was Sir Francis Bacon married? On May the 10th, 1606, 
Bacon, who was 45 years old, married Alice Barnum. She was 14. Today we think of 14 as far too young for marriage, yet it was not so then. Alice, who was a commoner and not intellectually gifted, was probably chosen to placate King James, who would have been aware of Francis's bloodline. By marrying a commoner, the claim to the throne is removed. It also protects Bacon, who could have been marked as a threat to the monarchy. This is an eyewitness account of the wedding ceremony, taken from a letter of May the 11th, 1606, written by Dudley Carlton to John Chamberlain. Sir Francis Bacon was married yesterday to his young wench in Marylebone Chapel. He was clad from top to toe in purple. The choice of purple was significant because by a law passed in 1464, no commoner could wear purple. Bacon chose to flout the law, perhaps in a last defiant gesture as to his birthright. He was not penalised. Francis and Alice remained childless. Could it be that Francis and his young bride never consummated the marriage? At the age of 14, Alice would hardly be likely to force the issue of intercourse and there is speculation that Bacon is bisexual. At 21 years of age, Alice was rumoured to have found a lover. In 1626, Bacon died aged 66 years old. Eleven days later, Alice married a Sir John Underhill, who was the gentleman usher of their household. Death of Sir Francis Bacon, 1561-1626 Eulogies to Bacon Bacon's death was the occasion of a great outflow of tributes from the literary establishment as well as from the country in general. A special publication resulted, known as Monis Verulami. It is important to keep this in mind. This contained 32 elegies written on the death of Francis Bacon by his colleagues of Cambridge and Oxford. The most striking aspect of the praises in this publication of 1626 is the emphasis on his poetry rather than his prose or philosophical works with many references to Apollo, Pallas Athena and the Muses. Here are just a few of the eulogies. R.C. of Trinity College Thou were born of Minerva, Minerva being the Roman name for Pallas Athena. Rector, King's College He wrote stories of love more refined which still do interpret Great Bacon's muse with vigour choicer by far than the nine muses fabled in story. William Boswell None who survive him can marry so sweetly Themis the goddess of the law to Pallas the goddess of wisdom. Other eulogies called him the master of fable, the noble day star of the muses. Quirinus, which is Spear Shaker, the Tenth Muse, the Learned Apollo, the leader of the great band of muses. Acknowledging Bacon's poetry, the jewel most precious of letters concealed, R.C. of Trinity College, part of thy works truly lies buried, Robert Ashley. These clear words from Bacon's literary friends show that they acknowledged he wrote with the penmanship of a genius. The dates which these two men lived and died are of great importance. Dealing with the plays and their connection to Sir Francis Bacon. Let's begin with medicine in Shakespeare. Statement made by Orville Owen, MD. Here I make an extraordinary statement, which is, if William Shakespeare wrote the plays bearing his name, he discovered the circulation of the blood instead of Dr. William Harvey. And further, 
If Shakespeare wrote the plays, Harvey stole the discovery from Shakespeare, which is, of course, nonsense. Dr William Harvey took his literary degree at Caius College, Cambridge, and his medical degree at the Great School of Medicine at, at Padua. In the year 1615, Harvey was appointed Lumleian Professor at Bartholomew Hospital, and in the latter part of 1616, Dr Harvey made his first discovery of blood circulation, but did not make it public until the year 1619, when he published a little monograph upon the subject. Keep in mind, William Shakespeare of Stratford died in 1616. With accusations of witchcraft still being a possible threat, it was not until the year 1628 that Harvey became fully sure the world was ready for the announcement. In that year, he published the work which makes him famous at the present day. As the 1623 folio is the only edition having all the so-called Shakespeare plays, we will use it as the basis of comparison. Knowledge of blood circulation is evident in Coriolanus, Romeo and Juliet, Love's Labour's Lost, Twelfth Night, The Winter's Tale, Merchant of Venice, All's Well That Ends Well, King John, As You Like It. Reading quotations from these plays with their references to arteries, veins, inferior veins, spirits run through the veins, pulse surcease, purple distilling liquor blush, nimble spirits through the arteries, etc. The playwright unquestionably displays knowledge of blood circulation. Keep in mind Shakespeare, 1616, was in his grave and Dr Harvey didn't make public his first little monograph on blood circulation until 1619, but would, of course, be conducting his circulation experiments in front of university students. This is a telling extract from a document signed by Sir Francis Bacon, who witnessed one of Dr Harvey's experiments. I have oft seen Dr William Harvey, the new doctor from Padua at Bartholomew Hospital, in the presence of the learned doctors, force a purple distilling liquor through the veins of a dead body. And after it had descended to the heart, liver and lungs, the blood-coloured liquor returneth again to the face, which black and full of blood, or pale, meagre and bloodless before, doth blush and beautify, as if with life. You would think the body breathed, the very, very lip is warm to look upon, but we are mocked with art, as there is no pulse against the finger, and though the arteries seem full, yet no life is present. The legs, waist, arms, hands, brow and limbs seem alive, but we can never ransom nature. This written eyewitness account of one of Dr Harvey's experiments proves beyond doubt Bacon was aware of blood circulation features as are described in the Shakespeare plays. Love's Labour's Lost By common consent, this play is ranked as one of the earliest of the Shakespeare dramas. The scene is laid at the court of Navarre and in precisely those regions of France which Francis Bacon had visited 1576 to 1579 during his residence abroad. French professor Abel Lefranc, though not arguing for the authorship of Francis Bacon, has made a very special study of this play. Lefranc states that it is apparent the author of Love's Labour's Lost knew and had visited the court of Navarre. He also states that many of the allusions cannot be fully understood unless the reader is acquainted with the memoirs of Margaret de Valois, the then Princess of France. This is extremely important 
because it proves the author of the play had knowledge of the inner history of the court of Navarre. Also, the character of Amado identifies with Antonio Perez, an intimate friend of the Bacons. He was a Spaniard who for a while gained favour at the English court. More evidence supporting Love's Labour's lost connection. The name in Anthony Bacon's passport. Not long after Anthony Bacon's return to England in 1592, following a nine-year stay in at Navarre, Love's Labour's Lost saw its first private performance at his Bishop's Gate house, well in advance of the play's first publication in 1598. Four of the play's primary characters are named Jumaine, Longueville, Byron and Boyet. Anthony Bacon's passport, currently residing in the British Museum, contains four distinct signatures, Jumain, Longueville, Barone and Boyet. Other than his brother Francis, who else would have had access to the passport? The only rational explanation for how the four names later came to appear in Love's Labour's Lost is that the collaborating Bacon brothers put them there. Measure for Measure Mr E.J. Castle, QC, considered this play to display much legal knowledge. He says, throughout the whole play, we find traces of it being the work of one thoroughly acquainted with legal proceedings. In other words, these plays could by no possibility have been written by any layman. They give date details taken from the life of a practising lawyer. It is impossible to exaggerate the importance of this fact. It virtually fixes the authorship on Francis Bacon. King John A Professor Bengoff made a detailed analysis and comparison of the play King John and Francis Bacon's History of Henry the Seventh. The results convinced him that the same mind was responsible for both works. To quote a few sentences from this article. Parallel use of quaint words strikes one as peculiar. Example. Tickling, coop, brag, copy, gall, prate, parley, cincture, underprop. Henry the Seventh contains a dozen such words of which the quaint use receives perfect illustration from as many lines scattered over the play. Of 22 metaphors in both King John and Bacon's Henry VII history, at least 12 of these metaphors are rather unusual, some very much so, and that any short works by two different authors should contain them all is beyond the doctrine of chance. Othello. In connection with the publication of Othello, we have strong evidence that the Stratfordian Shakespeare could not possibly have been the author. Othello was virtually the same play as the Moor of Venice, produced before the court on the 1st of November 1604. In 1613, it is performed again as part of the marriage festivities of King James's daughter, Princess Elizabeth. However, no printed version is known prior to the quarto of 1622. This was not a pirated edition, since the publisher states that he obtained his coffee from the Master of the Revels. One year later, the 1623 folio was published. Othello is seen to contain some 160 new lines, besides extensive emendations by the hand of the author. Yet the presumed author, William Shakespeare, died in 1616. Richard III This play, first printed in 1597, appeared in 1622. Yet in the very next year, 1623, 
we find the folio version giving no less than 193 fresh lines besides some 2,000 minor emendations of text. How is this possible? William Shakespeare of Stratford had been seven years in his grave. Henry VI Parts 1 and 2 of this play are known to have existed as early as 1587, which is just about the time that the young Shakespeare was trudging up to London to seek a living. Moreover, included in the three parts of Henry VI, there are 30 scenes in London, 20 in France, in the very provinces visited by Bacon, three at St Albans, his ancestral home, one at the Temple, familiar to him as a lawyer, and one in Parliament, also familiar to him from the year 1584 onwards. A very remarkable fact with regard to Henry VI, Part One, occurs in Act Three, Scene Three. It is the interview in the open field between Joan of Arc and the Duke of Burgundy, where the eloquent pleading of the maid overcomes all resistance on the part of the Duke. Historically, no such interview ever took place. However, in France 1780, a well-known historian of the House of Burgundy, a Monsieur Brugier de Berante, found in the archives a letter dated July the 17th, 1429. It was addressed to the then reigning Duke. It contains a passionate appeal from Joan of Arc to the Duke to take precisely the same course of action which is urged upon him in the play. The existence of this letter was unknown in Elizabethan England. Neither Hall nor Hollingshed nor any other English chronicler of that period mentions it. And yet this identical letter opened the series of negotiations that finally resulted in the Treaty of Peace in 1435, as represented in the play. The dramatist has simply changed its form. A spoken address in the open field is better suited to stage effects rather than a letter. Francis Bacon, while living overseas, is known to have visited the battlefields and the archives of France and Burgundy. Also, like so many of the Shakespeare plays, Henry VI is replete with legal technicalities. Merry Wives Dr Caius, this ridiculous character in the play, was drawn from life. The prototype was Dr John Caius of Cambridge University, a physician, the founder of Gonville Hall, which still in part bears his name, and his reputation with the students as an exceedingly choleric and revengeful instructor. His true name was K, K A Y E, but as he had been educated abroad and was inclined to ape foreign manners, he changed his English name into its Latin form, Caius. To complete the likeness between the two characters, dramatic and historical, we find that one, both were physicians, two, both came from abroad, three, both were phenomenally quarrelsome, even to the extent of inflicting chastisement upon others with their own hands. Four, both hated Welshmen. Dr John Caius died in July 1573. Therefore, nine years old, William Shakespeare, living in Stratford, could not possibly have known him. On the other hand, Francis Bacon, who entered the university in April 1573, three months before Dr Caius's death, would be well aware of Dr Caius's reputation. The Merchant of Venice and the Name Anthony The name Anthony occurs in no less than eight of the plays. Antonio in The Merchant of Venice figures as a generous devoted brother. In 1598, 
when Francis Bacon was in financial difficulties and was actually seized and imprisoned at the instance of a Jewish creditor, Anthony Bacon came to his assistance and did everything in his power to help. This imprisonment occurred shortly before the date usually assigned for the writing of this play. The Winter's Tale Always a student and lover of nature, Bacon diligently experimented upon the nature of plants, flowers and fruits. He knew the proper seasons for growth and was adept at the art of grafting to produce new varieties. When Bacon's essay on gardens and the play The Winter's Tale are read together, written as they both are in that singular style of elegance, brevity and beauty and depth of science, which is so markedly characteristic of Bacon, whether in verse or prose, it becomes next to impossible to doubt who wrote this play. Hamlet Excerpt from Francis Bacon, Our Shakespeare, written by Edwin Reed, 1902. The tragedy of Hamlet was written in or about 1586, but not printed until 1603. In this first draft of the play, we find this quote. Act 2, Scene 2. Doubt that an earth is fire, Doubt that the stars do move, doubt truth to be a liar, but do not doubt I love. First line, doubt that in earth is fire. The belief in the existence of a mass of molten matter at the centre of the earth was then, as it is now, universal. But for some reason, the author of the play changed his mind. Within one year after the play was published, the second edition of Hamlet came from the press in 1604. Then the first line of the stanza already quoted was made to read as follows. Doubt that the stars are fire. The doctrine of a central fire in the earth was thus taken out of the play, sometime between the appearance of the first edition in 1603 and that of the second in 1604. How can this be accounted for? Francis Bacon wrote a tract in the latter part of 1606 entitled Cogitations de Natura Rerum. In this tract, evidently a fresh study of the subject, Bacon boldly took the ground that the earth is a cold body, cold to the core, and only cold body as he afterwards affirmed in the entire universe, all others, sun, planets and stars, being of fire. It appears then that Bacon adopted this new view of the Earth's cold interior at precisely the same time that the author of Hamlet did, and it went against unanimous opinion of physicists throughout the world. There are several coincidences linking Bacon to Hamlet, but I'll give just one more. Hamlet, Act 5, Scene 1, The Grave Scene. In the first known edition of Hamlet, 1603, alas, poor Yorick, is said to have been dead a dozen years. In the 1604 quarto, printed the following year, the playwright has amended a dozen years, to having been dead 23 years. Why the change one year later? A possible explanation is this. King Henry VIII's jester, John Hayward, died about 1580-81, 23 years approximately, before the 1604 second edition of Hamlet. He was the last of the king's jesters and it is recorded that the then Princess Elizabeth rewarded him for his jesting. He was still alive when she became queen in 1558. Francis Bacon, being of noble birth, would have been aware of John Haywood and may even have met him at court. 
jesters were highly thought of, and John Hayward's death would not have gone unnoticed. What caused the playwright to alter the burial time for Yorick to match that of real-life jester, John Hayward? Was it a memory resurfacing? The timing is too exact to be coincidental. Timon of Athens Timon of Athens was never printed in quarto and never produced on any stage before its appearance in the first folio of 1623. Contemporary literature gives no hint of its existence prior to 1623. The question may therefore be asked, if this play was written by Will Shakespeare, where was the manuscript during the period between Shakespeare's death in 1616 and its appearance seven years later in the folio? The experience of Francis Bacon, after his fall from power, are very similar to those of Timon in the play. He also suffered from the ingratitude of a great number of so-called friends who deserted him. Bacon fell from power in 1621 and the play, Timon, is first heard of two years afterwards in 1623. The Tempest, a tale of a shipwreck. Francis Bacon assisted the Earls of Southampton Pembroke and Montgomery in financing an expedition to colonise the Virginias. The ship named Sea Venture, under the command of Admiral Sir George Summers, was chartered to go out with supplies. In 1609, this ship was wrecked on the island of Bermuda, known then as the Isle of Devils. William Strachey, a passenger on board the Sea Venture, sent a detailed letter of the shipwreck back to England. It gave graphic details of the storm which drove the ship onto the rocks. Being a private letter, its contents would not have been made known to the general public. Only those who financed the expedition would have had the opportunity to read its content. Therefore, William of Stratford could not possibly have seen it. Most Shakespearean scholars agree that The Tempest was inspired by the story of the sea venture and that the author must have read Strachey's letter due to the details in the play. The language used in describing the storm and breaking up of the ship, it is almost identical to that in the letter. Sir Francis Bacon is known to have read Strachey's letter. Richard II the play Richard II had much incensed Elizabeth and she asked Francis Bacon, being then of her learned counsel, whether there was no treason contained in it. He answered, No, madam, for treason I cannot deliver opinion that there is any, but very much felony. The Queen asked, How and wherein? Bacon answered, because the author had stolen many of his sentences and conceits out of Cornelius Tacitus. We know that whole pages of the Annals of Tacitus were used in Richard II. The play was staged in 1597. This play was published anonymously in the first instance, and that only when the Queen was hunting for its author to rack him the new edition of 1598 was issued with the name of William Shakespeare as author. Was this the moment to print a real author's name upon it? Bacon was the concealed author and that his knowledge of its copying from Tacitus was an unconscious admission of the fact. Edward Johnson writes that Will Shakespeare, actor, whose name is now being used for the plays, asked to be given a house at Stratford when he went back there as a safeguard from Queen Elizabeth's wrath. Bacon knew the actor at the theatre and had come to an arrangement with him 
because of the similarity of his name and that of Bacon's pseudonym, Sheikh-Spear, Pallas Athena. Shakespeare was given £1,000, a new place, which formerly belonged to Bacon's aunt, Lady Anne Russell. The deeds to the house were not formally transferred to Shakespeare until some years afterwards. Henry VIII In the play Henry VIII, thought to be Shakespeare's last play, four lords, under orders from the king, relieve Cardinal Wolsey of the great seal of office. They are the Earl of Shrewsbury, Earl of Northumberland, Duke of Norfolk and the Duke of Suffolk. Historically, this is incorrect. It was well known that Cardinal Wolsey was relieved of the Great Seal by only two lords, the Earl of Shrewsbury and Earl of Northumberland. So what motivated the playwright to alter known historical fact? Why include a Duke of Norfolk and a Duke of Suffolk? These are two of the four nobles definitely present at Bacon's dismissal from high office but certainly not at Wolsey's. This distortion of history is intriguing. The Northumberland Manuscript Bacon and Shakespeare Manuscripts in One Portfolio In 1867, in Northumberland House, a manuscript folder was discovered, which at one time had been in Francis Bacon's possession. The folder listed some of Bacon's well-known works, along with two of the Shakespeare plays, Richard II and Richard III. It is the only Elizabethan document that has both the names Shakespeare and Francis Bacon written together. The Northumberland Manuscript is a valuable contemporary document which, although somewhat damaged by a fire in old Northumberland House, survives to prove that Shakespeare's manuscripts of Richard II and Richard III were once tied up in a portfolio with Francis Bacon's Conference of Pleasure. Here are some of the notes on the original list of contents and the jottings on the cover. Revealing day through every cranny peeps. This is practically a line from The Rape of Lucrece. The only difference being that the word spies is used in the play instead of peeps. The name Shakespeare or William Shakespeare and the name Bacon or Francis Bacon have been written upon the page several times. This association of the names and their conjunction on the title page of a collection of manuscripts must be of interest. It should be remembered that no trace of an original manuscript of any play or poem ascribed to Shakespeare of Stratford has ever been discovered. The Northumberland manuscript is not in Bacon's handwriting, but neither is it in the Stratfordians. Please keep in mind, Francis and Anthony Bacon owned a writing workshop, and people employed there would have been proficient in their writing skills. From London Evening Standard, July 30th, 1992. Handwriting expert Maureen Gandhi has added weight to claims that the Elizabethan author and philosopher Francis Bacon wrote the plays attributed to Shakespeare. She claims it is highly probable that Bacon was the author of a recently discovered Elizabethan manuscript describing a scene which bears a striking similarity to one from Henry IV. She compared a copy of the handwritten document thought to date back to the 1590s when Henry IV was written and published with the handwriting of 30 well-known scholars and statesmen of the Elizabethan era. Mrs. Ward Gandhi, who outlined her findings in a 20-page report, is a forensic document examiner, 
a job which often involves studying handwriting for the police and home office to establish fraud. She said, The shapes of the letters and style of writing in the Elizabethan document point to the writing being that of Bacon. The scene in the document describes a conversation in which an innkeeper tells two thieves of a man that lodged in our house last night that hath three hundred marks in gold. Similar conversations in an almost identical setting are described in Henry IV. In 1901, Robert Theobald wrote, If Bacon wrote Shakespeare, the promise is intelligible. If he did not, it is an insoluble riddle. Francis Bacon's promise is by itself sufficient evidence to show that the man who wrote the promise also wrote the Shakespeare plays. Bacon kept a private memorandum of books which he called the promise of formularies and elegancies, which from time to time he jotted down any words, similes, phrases, proverbs or colloquialisms which he thought might come in useful in connection with his literary work. The word promise means storehouse. Bacon's promise contains nearly 2,000 entries in various languages, English, Greek, Latin, Italian, Spanish and French. The promise, which is in Bacon's own handwriting, fortunately was preserved. It is now in the Harleian collection at the British Museum. It was reproduced and published for the first time in 1883. No one knows the exact date when Bacon commenced his collection, but the years 1594 and 1596 are written against some of the notations. The promise was a collection of private notebooks. It was unknown to the public for a period of more than 200 years. It is a significant fact that Bacon, in works published under his own name, makes very little use of the notes in the promise. So what was the purpose of keeping this collection of phrases, etc.? The answer is they were used in his dramatic works published under the pseudonym William Shakespeare. A great number of the promise entries are reproduced in the Shakespeare plays, some even word for word. Stratfordians try to get over this fact by contending that these expressions were in common use at the time. But why would a writer waste his time making a special note of anything that was in common usage? Many words and expressions in the promise frequently occur in the Shakespeare plays. Yet it is highly improbable an actor named William Shakespeare would have been given permission to access Sir Francis Bacon's private notebooks. A most important piece of evidence in the promise is the word Albada, A-L-B-A-D-A, dated 1594-96 to and is Spanish for good dawning. It is known Bacon spoke Spanish. This expression, good dawning, only appears once in English print, namely in the play King Lear, first printed in 1608, Act 2, Scene 2. Good dawning to thee, friend. Bacon's promise collection contains many such salutations. Good morrow, good soir, good matin, bonjour, good day. These notes were made in the promise in 1596. It is a remarkable coincidence that in the following year, 1597, when the play Romeo and Juliet was published, it contained several of these greetings. Afterwards, they appeared in other Shakespeare plays. Good morrow being used 115 times, good day 
15 times, and good soir, 12 times. These salutations are unique. They are found only in Bacon's promise, plus the Shakespeare plays. Nowhere else in English literature. William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon Within Holy Trinity Church, Stratford-upon-Avon, at the time the 1623 Shakespeare folio was being published, a mysterious monument featuring a bust of Shakespeare was erected. No one knows who arranged for its construction or who paid for it. Another peculiarity about the monument was that this bust of Shakespeare bore no resemblance to the Drochout portrait which adorned the 1623 folio. Moreover, there was nothing about the image suggesting that it had any connection to literature. Instead, the bust depicted a rustic-looking man with a stern face and a drooping moustache clutching a sack of grain. A fitting representation, considering Shakespeare from Stratford was known to have been a grain merchant in later years. The re reason we know about the original bust is due to an engraving which appeared in Sir William Dugdale's Book of Warwickshire, published in 1656. In 1748, after a century of neglect, the original grain merchant bust was replaced by that of a completely different looking individual, and so it remains to the present day. Alfred Dodd offers this description. The effigy which stands in place of the curious original are in general outline the same, but a cushion takes the place of the bag and a large quill pen is placed in his hand. His hands no longer suggest that he hugs his grain or wool sack and the smirking doll-like face, very different from the original. The Myth Maker In 1769, the celebrated London actor David Garrick travelled to Stratford to pay homage to a man he erroneously thought, based on the wording in the folio, to have authored the Shakespearean work. Upon his arrival, Garrick found the Stratford citizens to be profoundly oblivious as to who Shakespeare was. The village was ravaged by filth and decay. All vestiges of the mud wall houses in which the Shakespeare family allegedly dwelled were long gone. But Garrick the actor became Garrick the entrepreneur. He saw an opportunity to turn Stratford and Shakespeare into a profitable enterprise. Thus Garrick, wittingly or unwittingly, cashed in on the nebulous legacy of the 1623 folio and the Stratfordian myth of the man the world came to know as the great, greatest writer of the English language was born. Almost instantaneously Garrick began to use his celebrity to attract outside visitors with money to spend to his Stratford jubilees. He produced and starred in virtually all of the Shakespearean plays. Other profitable jubilee attractions included guided tours of Shakespeare's alleged birthplace and souvenirs of furniture and other miscellaneous items, supposedly once owned by Shakespeare, were for sale. Shakespeare of Stratford had become a cottage industry. But more importantly, as the popularity of the Shakespearean work increased, the Stratford myth of Shakespeare gradually worked its way into the hallowed halls of orthodox history. Eventually, biographical books about the life of this man named Shakespeare began to materialise, using sheer invention and supposition, truth buried by presumptive extrapolation. Author Ross Jackson states, Many books were written about Will Shakespeare 
an uncritical and unquestioning public consumed them with great interest. What the public did not notice was that these books invariably started out with the unstated but tenuous assumption that the man from Stratford consisted mainly of speculations about how he must have done that, how he must have travelled there, how he must have known this person, how he must have been proficient in this language and how he must have been the greatest genius in literature that ever lived. Yet there's little or no evidence to back up the assertions. Amazingly, by the onset of the 19th century, the Stratfordian version of William Shakespeare, the author, was generally adopted as gospel among historical and literary academics. By the mid-19th century, many prominent writers and scholars had begun to scrutinise the Stratfordian doctrine. They discovered glaring holes and inconsistency in the traditional story. The Shakespeare Problem In order to create the Shakespearean works, the author had to meet certain criteria. First and most important is that he was a genius of the highest magnitude. He had to have had an education that far exceeded any ordinary university graduate. He was a master linguist, fluent in Latin, Greek, Italian, Spanish and French. He possessed a mastery of all classical literature, which included Homer, Ovid, Virgil, Cicero, Seneca, Plutarch, Tacitus, etc. He also had a superior knowledge of philosophy and science. He was a well-trained lawyer, possessing a highly sophisticated knowledge and understanding of the finer points of law. He was familiar with and accustomed to the manners and protocol of royal courts, both in England and France. He travelled abroad to many different foreign countries. He had knowledge of various sports enjoyed only by the noble class, most notably falconry. And finally, he was both a Rosicrucian and a Freemason. The author of the greatest works in English literature displays proficiency in all the above requirements. However, there is not a shred of evidence that Shakespeare of Stratford ever received an education, or that he ever owned a book, or that he ever wrote a letter, or that he ever travelled abroad. The acquired knowledge needed to write the great works is not proven. As far as the record shows, there are only six alleged instances in which he awkwardly scrawled a barely legible signature on various documents throughout his life. Each of the signatures suggests he was remarkably unskilled with a pen. Note that the Stratford man was not known as Shakespeare, nor did he ever write his name as such. In the six instances that he wrote his name, he invariably writes Shakespeare. His last will and testament makes no mention of books, manuscripts, notes, letters, or anything of a literary nature. Many of today's academic community have heavily invested in the Stratfordian myth, where there is a great deal of money and prestige to be had. Stratford-upon-Avon's visitor spending for this year, 2015, is said to be in excess of £428 million. Pounds. Hence, any investigation into the traditional view of Shakespeare meets with unjustified name-calling and fierce fanatical resistance. This response is despite hard evidence and a timeline confirming Sir Francis Bacon as the only historical figure who matches all criteria required for Shakespeare's authorship. Character, Assassination and Disinformation 
In 1837, Thomas Babington Macaulay, an English writer and politician, wrote a false and libelous essay about Francis Bacon. Macaulay, later Lord Macaulay, was a flamboyant, forceful writer whose speciality was sensationalised history. In other words, he was a hack writer with little concern about getting his facts straight. Macaulay vilified Bacon in every conceivable way. Unfortunately, many uninformed people blindly accepted Macaulay's lies as history. Stratfordians will shamelessly cite Macaulay as a historical source on Sir Francis Bacon, despite the fact that Oxford University ordered all of Macaulay's works to be placed in a special category as not trustworthy to history. Winston Churchill referred to Macaulay as the prince of literary rogues who always preferred the tale to the truth. Ironically, near the end of his life, Macaulay said he regretted having written his disparaging essay on Bacon. Bacon the Concealed Poet The poet Gerald Massey noted the philosophical writings of Bacon are suffused and saturated with Shakespeare's thought. The poet and essayist Alexander Smith wrote, He, Bacon, seems to have written his essays with the pen of Shakespeare. While the essayist and historian Thomas Carlyle proclaimed, There is an understanding manifested in the construction of Shakespeare's plays, equal to that in Bacon's writing, Novum Organum. Toby Matthew, Bacon's secretary, wrote his master a letter in which he states about Bacon. The most prodigious wit that ever I knew, though he is known by another name. Years later, John Aubrey described Bacon as a good poet, but concealed. Great poets always recognise the genius of other great poets even when they are concealed. With regard to Bacon, Percy Shelley said, Lord Bacon was a poet. His language has a sweet and majestic rhythm which satisfies the senses, no less than the almost superhuman wisdom of his philosophy satisfies the intellect. Letting Percy Shelley have the last word, I have now finished this presentation.